Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to God's house on now the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And so, so happy that you could be here today and be a part of our worship as we praise our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. And then a little later today, uh, this morning, I mean, we're going to be uh, focusing during the sermon on our gospel lesson. And we see there that uh, on the very outset of our Lord's uh, public ministry, Jesus was confronted with the choice of either going God's way, which was the way of the cross, or going the easy way, and that would be giving in to Satan's temptations. But we praise God that we see our Savior passing the test. And if we are strong in the word, we can overcome his temptations as well. So we're going to talk more about that in today's sermon as Jesus, uh, as we listen to Jesus actually teach us that Satan's temptations can only fail if, and that's the cliffhanger for the sermon. You've got to listen and find out how they will always fail if. So again, we're using our abbreviated version of uh, Right To, uh, found on page 60, but we'll begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 59. So let us turn now to page 60 in your hymnal as we continue with the invocation and following. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. We 
continue then at the bottom of page 61. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only begotten Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this unto us, O Lord. Amen. We continue then with the Gloria Patri. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We continue our worship as we focus now on the written Word of God, and maybe as you've looked at your bulletin already, the uh, Scripture lessons, the Old Testament in particular, uh, is so long that uh, we actually had to make, it's at the uh, the end of your bulletin there, but it had to be two pages because if we tried to shrink that up to uh, fit on one on the back of the bulletin like normal, we'd have had to pass out magnifying glasses, I'm sure. 
So, with that said, our Old Testament lesson for today does come to us from the book, 1 Samuel, chapter 17, various selected verses, I should say, but beginning with verse 4. So a challenger who represented the Philistines came out from the camp of the Philistines. His name was Goliath of Gath. He was nine feet, six inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore scaled body armor, which was made of more than 100 pounds of bronze. He had bronze greaves on his shins and a bronze spear slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead was made of 15 pounds of iron. His shield bearer went ahead of him. He would stand up and shout to the armies of Israel, Why have you come out to line up in battle formation? I am a Philistine, and you are servants of Saul, aren't you? Choose a man to represent you, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, we will be your servants. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our servants, and you will serve us. The Philistine would say, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Give me a man, and we will fight each other. When Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. David said to Saul, Do not let anyone lose heart because of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. But Saul said to David, You cannot go against this Philistine to fight with him because you are just a boy and he has, a warrior, he has been a warrior since he was a youth. David said to Saul, Your servant has been taking care of his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the lamb out of its mouth. When the lion reared up against me, I grabbed it by its mane, struck it, and killed it. Your servant struck both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has defied the ranks of the living God. David added, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go then, may the Lord be with you. So Saul dressed David in his own gear. He placed a bronze helmet on his head and dressed him in scaled body armor. David strapped his sword over his gear. David tried to walk around in them since he had never trained with this kind of equipment before. David said to Saul, I cannot go in these because I have never trained in them. So David took them off. Then David took his staff in his hand and picked five small, smooth stones out of the stream bed and put them into the pouch of his shepherd's bag. He took his sling in his hand and approached the Philistine. Then David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defiled. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth. Then all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle belongs to the Lord and he will deliver you into our hand. Then when the Philistines started advancing to attack David, David quickly ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag, took a stone from it, shot it from his sling, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank deep into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. This is the word of our Lord. Our epistle lesson comes to us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, namely Jesus, the Son of God, let us continue to hold on to our confession. For we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of our Lord. And our gospel lesson today, uh, which is really the gospel lesson of every first Sunday uh, in uh, the season of Lent, uh, talking about the temptation of our Savior Jesus by the devil himself. But this morning it comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. This will serve as the text for our sermon today, and so it will be read at that time. So let us now confess our Christian faith together, as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed, and you'll find that on page 69 of your hymnal. Page 69. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue then with our sermon hymn, hymn 260. peace, grace, and mercy of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Amen. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're turning to our gospel lesson from Luke's gospel chapter 4 that we'll be focusing on, and in particular, those verses 1 through 13 that are printed there in your bulletin, and I invite you to rise for this reading. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, 
where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. He did not eat anything during those days. When they came to an end, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The devil led him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil told him, I will give you all this power and the glory of these kingdoms because it has been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, because it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will lift you up with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it says, you shall not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Thus our text and we pray. Lord, you fully understand our struggles with temptation as you confronted, were confronted by the, the devil himself and you were victorious every time. Thank you for being our champion and help us to follow your example of using your word to defeat all of Satan's temptations and attacks. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, dear fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever watched a real-life story unfold where it was quite obvious that someone had no chance of victory? It could be a sporting contest where one team clearly outmatches the other. Maybe think of the Minnesota Vikings against Ricori's football team. Huh? Nothing against Ricori. Oh, you would win. That's what I just heard someone say. Okay. How about the Logansport High School <laughs> football team? Okay. Or it could also be a local election where one candidate is clearly more popular, more well-known than all of the other challengers put together. And there really isn't much drama to these kinds of events. Any potential entertainment value isn't going to be found in questioning who's going to win, but rather in how large the margin of victory is going to be. And I'll admit that I often feel this way about this text that we're looking at today, which describes for us Satan's attempts to distract or to detour Jesus from his goal of redeeming the whole world. Because as gripping as the story and the stakes of, the, as, of these events are, isn't the result an already foregone conclusion? Did Satan really have any possible chance of defeating our divine Savior? The simple biblical truth is this. Jesus was going to, is still, and always will defeat the devil in this sort of contest. However, even though the outcome is self-evident, the Lord still chooses to record these events for us three times in the Bible and does so with careful attention to detail. What this reveals is that God wants us to just take a moment and slow down and to ponder these words that we have before us and to hold tightly to the truth that the repetition of this story wants to teach us. And what he's teaching us is that the devil's temptations can only fail. Why or how? 
when they are directed at the Holy Son of God and when they are defeated by the Holy Word of God. Now, those thoughts might create some tension inside your heart and mind. Because on one hand, the result here of Jesus' battle with the devil never changes. Jesus always wins, doesn't he? But on the other hand, I can think of more than a, a few times in my life, maybe you can too, when I've, I've given in to temptation, which could hardly be described as a victory. In fact, from, the pers from that perspective, today's text seems like the exception more than the rule. When I face temptation, I often fail more times than I'd like to admit or want to. At least that's what my subjective evaluation would be. So it's important for us to realize how this text actually progresses and what circumstances are required to secure victory over temptation. That's why you'll want to pay close attention. Because there's not a single person here who doesn't experience Satan's attacks. He hates you. And he can't stand it that the Lord has brought you out of his darkness into his marvelous light, the Lord's light, and saved you for eternity. That burns Satan to no end. So listen carefully. The first and foremost important principle that we need to learn here today is how clever and crafty, we were talking about this Bible class this morning, the devil thinks he is. Jesus will always be ready and willing and able to defeat him. This truth is born out of the three temptations that we have described here for us. That the devil tries to uh, attack Jesus from a couple of different, well, actually three different uh, angles or attacks from the physical needs that he knows Jesus is suffering from. He tries to stroke our Lord's ego and then challenges the core of our faith. The devil even tries to use portions of God's word, you may have noticed there in the last temptation, to make his argument sound good. But the Holy Son of God, he sees right through every ruse, every disguise, and shuts down his opponent at every turn. And at the risk of repeating myself redundantly, the devil stood absolutely no chance to defeat Jesus. And so it's absolutely true that the devil's tempt temptations can only fail when they are directed to the Holy Son of God. So, what does that mean for you and me? Well, it means in the middle of our temptations, we better be quick to get Jesus involved. Because you see, the devil targets us with temptation because he knows that while he cannot defeat Jesus, he might gain some ground against us. You see, he knows that we are the ones with the weak and sinful natures that are more than eager sometimes to listen to his excuses and to his ego stroking and his partial truths and his outright lies. We have a nature that is drawn to that. If I think that I can handle some te such temptation on my own, then I'm doing nothing but deceiving myself. I need the power of Christ at my disposal and his presence to resist the devil so that he will flee. Now, what does that look like practically? It means that I develop the habit of praying in those first moments that I feel temptation coming on. And it means that I visualize the truth that God has already taught. 
that Jesus is right there with me in my car, uh, in my office, in my home, or even if I'm just walking down the street, the Lord's right there. I call Jesus by name, and as I ask him for help and strength to stand firm against my weaknesses and my sinful desires. And so instead of picturing the temporary pleasure of, of, the, of indulging in this temptation or that, I picture the eternal joy of a Savior who smiles at me with compassionate eyes and takes my frail hand into his glorious nail-pierced hand. I go into battle against the devil with my strong, victorious Savior right there at my side so that Satan isn't just attacking me, but he's attacking the two of us. And I do so confidently, knowing that the devil's temptations can only fail when they are directed not only at me, but also at the Son of God who's standing right there beside me. And I think it's vitally important for us to develop these, these habits, if you will, of visualizing the presence of our Savior when fighting temptation. Now, this isn't some sort of psychological trick that I'm speaking to you about here. Rather, it's the way for, a way for us to make more concrete that glorious truth that Jesus has already promised. Remember when he said, never will I leave you. Never will I abandon you. That's a promise to you personally from the Son of God himself. However, we still have another weakness. What if what if the devil can convince us that what we're doing isn't actually wrong? Or what if he can get us to imagine that our sinful course of action would actually have our Lord's approval? See? There's another angle of attack. Well, just so that we would be equipped against this method... Our text emphasizes not only Christ's victory over Satan, but also the way that Jesus uses his word, uses the scriptures to achieve that victory. And again, this theme is so obvious in our text that it practically hits us over the head. In Luke's description of these events, Jesus speaks no words except that which come from scripture itself. See, here's God versus Satan. Jesus could have said, get out of here and go like that and flip Satan all the way to the end of eternity. He could have. But what did he do? Each response you may have seen there is prefaced with the words, it is written. Because his strategy for victory is a strategy that you and I can employ. He did that to emphasize the authority of that very scripture that you and I have at our disposal. Now, as we've mentioned, the Son of God, Jesus, could have commanded Satan to just get out of here and never bother him again, and Satan would have to do it. He would have no choice because the word of Jesus, the word of God, is that powerful. But as the Lamb of God, our Savior depended on the strength of God's word, which are the scriptures, the Bible, so that we would be able to imitate him, using the same word as our defense and our strength. But that's probably one of the great weaknesses of God's people here on earth. Because far too often, neglecting to use and commit to memory God's word, we have to raise our hand and say guilty. It's not so hard 
to know what God says about various subjects. But it does take time to do enough reading and studying of God's Word to let those words actually become a part of us. Too often we are content to rely on others, you know, like parents or maybe your spouse or, or even pastors, to know what God's Word says. And then to be content that as long as we know where to go, if a question comes up or a temptation comes up, then we don't really need to bother ourselves with searching the Scriptures on our own or to know about what it is that we, pro we profess as our faith. Why? We confess that. It's almost akin to a weightlifter who, who buys $10,000 worth of gym equipment, but he never picks up a single dumbbell. The equipment's there, but he doesn't use it. And see, here's the real danger. And don't think for a minute that's not one of Satan's tricks as well. To get you to have that whole gym right there loaded to the hilt but never to use it. Because if we think that we can go into battle against the devil without letting the word become part of who we are, then all we're doing is setting ourselves up for failure. We cannot defeat Satan on our own. I will admit to you that this is probably the most common problem I have in facing temptation. Either I've neglected the word and wasn't ready when the temptation came, or I've conveniently forgotten that word for the sake of my own sinful desires. I'm guessing there are one or two others here that could say the same thing. But you see, dear ones, in either case, my sinful nature has gotten the best of me. But such experiences only highlight even further our dependence on God's Word to defeat the devil. God's Word works because there we have the truth that pierces and exposes Satan's lies. There in the Word of God, we have a Savior who covers all of our sins by paying for them on His blood-stained cross leaving the devil with no room to accuse us. You know, a sword does a soldier no good if he just leaves it in his scabbard. So keep your primary weapon against the devil, ever polished and ready for battle whenever the attack may come. And remember, dear brothers and sisters, our sinful nature is so insistent and so annoying and so persistent that it will never stop attacking. And the devil is the same way too. But let each of us remember as well that God's intent for each and every one of us in this text is to show us that the devil and all of his attacks are truly a lost cause. Because when God's people stick close to Christ and rely on the power of His Word alone, the devil's temptations can only fail. And that is, my friends, the gospel truth. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. And so just a quick reminder to everybody to uh, fill out the uh, worship participation card if you haven't done so already. And let me know then too that uh, if you have... Uh, any information that has changed, like phone number, email, address, whatever, you know, put that on the card, let Linda know, and she'll make the, the changes for our, our uh, directory. And also, if you have any specific prayer requests that you'd like for me to be praying during the week, Linda always gets those to me 
uh, as well, and I include you, <clears throat> or include them, I should say, in our personal prayers, in my personal prayers, okay? When you have that filled out, just remember, just put it in the offering plate. It's in the back of the sanctuary as you leave today. And so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the world, by its many sins, has kindled the fires of your wrath. And no one, be they ever so perfect, can rob death of its sting, nor hell of its terror. And yet, though we are by nature the children of wrath, you loved us with such a great love that you did not spare your own son but gave him up for us all. You sent him here in our likeness to do for us what we ourselves could not do, and that is to give you a perfect ransom for our sins. Please receive our prayers by which we confess our many sins and humbly ask for your pardon. Accept also our prayer of praise and thanks for providing us with a perfect salvation through your Son. And dear Jesus, it is indeed holy ground upon which we in spirit stand to view your cross. Because there you endured God's wrath and justice against our sins, suffering and dying for us. We thank you that when you appeared in your first advent to this wicked world, you came not as a judge to condemn, but as a savior to save us. In our dying hour, nothing can comfort us but the blood that you shed in our behalf. And while we live here, there is no treasure that we can desire to equal the treasure of salvation that you won for us and now offer in your word. Nothing we achieve in this world can begin to compare to the redemption that you accomplished for us. There are no earthly relationships that can mean as much to us as having you as our dear friend and our Savior. And so we praise you with all our being, precious Redeemer. And we ask that you would now hear the prayers that come from the hearts of your dear people. Again, dear Father, we offer to you our sincere thanks and praise that the tests taken from Hunter's uh, neck have been determined not to be cancerous or life-threatening. Thank you for that good news and continue to bless him and provide for all the healing that Hunter needs. And continue to be with your servant Roger Canal says the doctors continue to determine Roger's diagnosis and the proper course of action that he will need to battle his physical ailment. We pray that you would provide him with complete healing and a return to good health as you see fit. And so we place him into your hands, dear Lord, knowing that you have him safely in your care. And Father in heaven, we also pray on behalf of our brothers and sisters in faith in the country of Ukraine. We ask that you would provide safety and peace to our staff working in your name in that gift of life program, as well as the people that they serve. Grant them strength of faith, reminding them that no matter the circumstances, you are with them. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukrainian Lutheran Church. Preserve their faith, strengthen their leaders and pastors, and their members, that they may show the light of the gospel in this dark time to all people. And finally, Lord, we ask that you change the hearts of those who would cause war and destruction. Lead them to turn from violence and to seek peace with their neighbors instead. Let your word be the guide of all and cause it to spread to all people, bringing the peace and the comfort that comes only through your Son, Jesus. And to you, Holy Spirit, our light divine, 
We pray that you would enter our hearts with your blessings and abide there. Take away any trust we may have in our own righteousness and lead us always to make sincere confession of our sins and our own unworthiness. Fill us with a steadfast faith that continually trusts all that Christ has done for our salvation. And when He comes to judge the world, may He count us as God's children and heirs of eternal life. During this Lenten tide, may our Savior's sacrifice on the cross, may that occupy our thoughts, so that through solemn meditation, our faith may be greatly strengthened and we may acquire a new sense of devotion to our Christian duties. Help us to live Christ, to confess His holy name, to abide in His word, to follow wherever He leads, and to bear our crosses patiently. All this we ask in your precious name. Amen. And now we pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now turn to page 76 in your hymnal as we continue with the Sanctus. We'll continue then with the words of uh, institution and distribution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come now to receive the Lord's Supper. And now may his body and his blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. And now with believing hearts receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace. Well, again, a, a great big thanks to all of you for uh, worship, worshiping with us here today and uh, praising our Savior and our King Jesus. And it's always our prayer that you have been um, blessed and strengthened through God's Word as well as His body and blood in the Holy Sacrament. And also that you find encouragement in the fellowship of fellow believers. Thank you, Nancy, for uh, providing the music and uh, some special things there. 
during the service. We appreciate that very much. By way of announcements, just uh, briefly here uh, in our bulletin, um, we do a repeat of our Sunday morning Bible class on Tuesdays at 10. So if you'd like to join us then, you're uh, certainly welcome to do that. And uh, we would love to uh, have you if you've never joined us before. Uh, you'll note there we are in the season of Lent, so we've begun our midweek services, and we're focusing on some uh, specific crucial hours of our Lord's journey to and on the cross. And so please join us on Wednesday nights as uh, we uh, gather for that at 7 p.m. This particular Wednesday, we're talking about how the Lord says that the, the devil, who we were just talking about, wishes to sift us. He told his disciples, the devil wishes to sift all of you. And the same is true for us. So come and learn how, uh, uh, what that means and how we're victorious through that as well. Wise men, wise women meeting this Thursday morning at uh, 9 a.m. Also, the uh, school board is meeting this Thursday at 5. I don't think Trish is here. I didn't see her, but she's up. Uh, I'm sure she knows that. And also, uh, just to make note too, there is a prayer book located on the registrar, uh, registration table. Excuse me. And uh, we've set that out there. If you happen to have a prayer uh, need that you'd like for us to pray during the service, but you didn't have time to get to me before, or maybe it just came up all of a sudden, if you write it on that prayer book back there, uh, one of the ushers or an elder will bring it up to me and we'll include them in the prayers as well. So that's what uh, that is about. And then you've no you'll probably have noticed there is an announcement about uh, uh, giving for the Ukrainian Lutheran Church. Uh, please take a look at that announcement. You can send money to uh, our uh, ELS if you'd like to, and the information is there. But there's also a basket in the back. If, you, if that would be easier, just to write it out to the church and then put Ukrainian or Ukraine on the memo part, uh, we'll collect all of that and we'll make sure that it gets sent to the right people. Were you raising your hand? Oh, it looked like you were going like this. Okay, you, you weren't going like this? Yeah, all right. I just thought you were for some reason. I thought your hand went up. Anyway, okay. So, and then one more thing that I'd like to say is, um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, back in 1933, the board game Monopoly was trademarked by the American businessman. His name was Charles Darrow of uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. And by the way, that's what the town is representing on the game board. Don't know if you knew that either. But it went on to sell more than 250 million games worldwide and over a billion people across the whole world have played it to date. Now, curiously, however, during the year previous, stay with me, in 1932, Beverly Ruth Northcutt, who we know affectionately as Beverly Densmore, was born. So, now follow, in 1932, Bev was born, and in 1933, Monopoly is trademarked and goes on to become the third most popular board game in the world. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> so, the next time you happen to be playing Monopoly, just remember that 90 years ago, Bev Densmore was born, and the very next year, the game Monopoly hit the store shelves. I am sure there has to be a connection there somewhere. <laughs> or you could join us uh, right after church for some special cake provided in honor of Bev's 90th birthday, and we can enjoy some good fellowship together as well. But we want to wish Bev a happy 90th birthday. I think everybody knows her, you know, she's in the very back there. But if you can't stay for cake, if you have to get going, maybe you can just wish her a happy birthday on the way out. It's actually tomorrow, right? So you're a young 89 right now. <laughs> but tomorrow, you're 90. May God bless your daily walk with Christ, and I'll usher you out. <laughs>